What is going on guys? In this video, we are gonna be talking about API throttling and rate limiting. Throttling or rate limiting is an important concept if you are building APIs and if you're using an API that is rate controlled, then you definitely need to know about how this works since it's gonna impact how you use that service or API. So in this video, we're gonna go through a bunch of different things. So the first section is just gonna talk about what API throttling or rate limiting is. From there, we're gonna talk about why applications rate limit. And then third, we're gonna talk about different rate limiting techniques. And in this section, I'm gonna go over two of the most common rate limiting techniques. And then from there, we're gonna talk about the implications of rate limiting. And we're gonna discuss that through both the server perspective, which is you know whoever is building the API, and then the client perspective, so whoever is using the API. So let's start this out by going over the definition of rate limiting. So the definition of rate limiting is a technique that allows a service to control the consumption of resources used by an instance of an application, an individual tenant, or an entire service. So there's a couple interesting points in this definition, so let's just highlight that really quick. Uh, so it's a technique that allows the service to control the consumption of resources. When we say consumption of resources here, what we're talking about is the number of concurrent requests to an application that, you know, if you're talking to a database in this application, that consumes resources. It consumes CPU cycles, memory, and then puts additional stress on that database. Uh, and it could be used by an instance of an application. So you can rate limit or throttle at an entire application level. You can also do the same at the individual level. So it can be either IP address, it could be a uh, client ID or something like this, or it could be at an entire service level. So this is most, uh, I think, relevant for those of you using service-oriented architecture. Uh, so over here, I just have a demonstration if you're using the Twitter API, and if you ever used it before, you probably know that you have limits uh, associated with your API developer key. So you probably have seen this exception before. If you haven't, this is what happens when you exceed your rate limits when you're using the Twitter API. And this is what is called a throttling exception, despite the fact that it says rate limit exceeded. Uh, this happens when the service just basically rejects your request because you've you've gone over the limit of allocated requests per time unit. So it could be per minute, per 15 minutes, per hour, whatever. But throttling like we're seeing here is a specific way in which servers can handle users that are exceeding their provision capacity on an API. So that's what throttling is or rate limiting is. Let's talk about why applications rate limit in the first place. Now, the most common reason is protection against distributed denial of service attacks. So if you have a public facing API, such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google Maps, all the different ones that you can think of, you don't want a single customer to be able to bring down your website, your application uh, for an entire population of other customers. So for instance, we don't want it such that me, Daniel, can hammer the Twitter API and basically break Twitter for the world, right? That's not a good thing. Now in the world of DDoS, you can have multiple different users that are all hitting the same API, but as long as you have some kind of identity concept, so, you know, filtering based on IP address or application name or, or API key, uh, any way that you can uniquely identify each customer, then you can protect yourself against a single bad actor or a group of bad actors that want to bring down your application or bring down your API. Uh, the second main reason is for server stability and consistency. So if you're a service owner, you're building an API, there's a certain level of performance that you want to ensure your clients. For instance, if I build an API, maybe I want to set the SLA or the service level agreement to say I'm always going to return a response within 100 milliseconds. But if I don't rate limit my APIs, I run the risk of, like I said, a single client overwhelming all the resources and degrading the experience for everyone else. Uh, so it's a useful tool for ensuring ensuring stability and consistency across all of your different customers. And the third important reason is cost control. So if you're building an API, maybe you only want to give a certain number of requests to a certain user uh, for a particular interval because maybe more requests cost more money. So rate limiting can be a useful uh, technique here to ensure that certain customers are only allowed to perform a certain number of actions within a time frame. Uh, so very, very useful there. So this is why applications rate limit. Let's move on now and discuss how applications actually do this. 
Uh, and there's going to be two different types of examples or techniques that I want to go through in terms of rate limiting. The first one is very, very simple. It's called the fixed window technique. Now the fixed window technique, let me just grab a pen over here. It's as you would imagine, you have a time period. Maybe we can represent it here. So, you know, T0 for start and T1 for some time later. And you're only allowed maybe five requests. That's just some arbitrary number that I made up. You're only allowed five requests within this time window. And then there can be multiple time windows that are just kind of stacked uh, across time. And you're allowed five within each unique time window. So very, very straightforward. Now this technique has a couple problems in the sense that if you consume all of your five requests right here at the beginning of your time window, then this duration that I'm kind of highlighting up until the end, you won't be able to make any requests. Uh, for that, you can use a slightly different technique to, to solve this problem called the sliding time window technique, where your window basically shifts across time. But I'm not going to go through that in this. I uh, just kind of wanted to discuss briefly what the fixed window technique looks like. Uh, it's very, very common. So here's an example of what the fixed window technique looks like in the context of Twitter API. So they use this technique. Uh, so if we take a look here, the endpoint has requests per 15 minute window and all these numbers that we're looking at. So tweets look up per application or per user. So you can have 300 per 15 minutes um, if you're an application and 900 if you're a user. So they're using this technique. It's very common for other ones as well, uh, including Google Maps and the like. Now, there's a second technique which I think is a little bit more fascinating, and that is what's called the token bucket technique. And so the way I like to think about the token bucket technique is in the context of a bucket that is being filled with water. Now, there's two main concepts in the token bucket algorithm. One is called burst, and the other one is called sustain. So burst in this example of a water bucket being filled corresponds to the size of your bucket. So if you have a really large bucket, you're capable of handi handling a lot of bursty requests that are all coming in at a particular moment in time. So that's what's called burst. Now, there's also another concept called sustain, which is basically the rate in which we're refilling requests. And requests are, are what are called tokens in this example. And it's usually based on some time interval. Um, so if you're using this, this technique, it's usually per second or per minute in some rare cases. The most times I've seen is per second. Uh, so sustain is essentially the rate in which you are pouring more requests, pouring more water into the bucket. So if you think about this over time, let's just run through an example here. Uh, let's say we're starting with an empty bucket. So we have a bucket size of, let's say, you know, 100 requests uh, or 100 droplets, so to speak. Um, and we currently have nothing in there. So if a request comes in at this point, there's it's going to be rejected, right? Now, every second, let's say we get 10 tokens or 10 droplets that get refilled. So at second one, I'll just draw in a little bit here. We'll have a little bit of volume that is available in this bucket. So if a request comes in, if a single request comes in, we'll decrement the amount by one droplet or one request. So there will only be nine. Now, if another second comes through, then, you know, we add another layer here. And let's just assume that no request came in during this time. So we add 10 and now we are at 19. And this goes on and on and on until we reach 100 up here, which is the maximum bucket size of our rate limited API. Now in this setup, if we have, you know, a refresh rate or a refill rate of 10 per second, and our maximum size is 100, that means if we have 10 seconds of duration where we don't receive any requests, then this bucket is gonna get filled up, right? It's gonna fill up with available requests that it can service. That means if we get a flurry of requests all within one second, they can all consume the burst capacity that's in the bucket. However, if they exceed 100 in one second, then they'll start getting throttled. So essentially what token bucket algorithm allows you to do is allows you to encode a concept of burstiness and ensure that if some applications make requests all at the same time, your application or your rate limiting algorithm will be able to handle it. But you're also ensuring that they have a healthy sustain rate. So for instance, uh, since our sustain rate is 10 in this case, this means that if they stay consistent over every second and consume 10 resources or 10 requests per second, this bucket will always be empty but this doesn't matter because if their traffic remains constant or consistent, then the bucket will always stay at the same level, basically for infinity. 
But this is what the token bucket algorithm is. Very, very common if you're using things like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or any of those cloud-based services, they generally use the token bucket algorithm. Now there's a variation of this algorithm called the leaky bucket algorithm. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that, but if you're more curious about that algorithm, I have a blog post about this presentation. I'll link in the description section. So you can go read about the token bucket and a little bit about the leaky bucket if you're interested in it. But for all intents and purposes, token bucket is probably the more important one. So this is how applications rate limit. Let's move on now and talk about the next section, which is the implications of rate limiting. Now there's two different implications. There's both the server perspective and the client perspective. So let's start this out by talking about the server perspective. So if you are a server, the first thing that you need to think about if you want to implement rate limiting is that you need to decide on a construct of identity for rate limiting your application. Now identity can be based on a couple different things. There's IP address, which can uniquely identify a machine that's making a call to a server. Uh, it can be based on client name if you want to you know, receive an input as your client name. Uh, and it could also be based on API keys, which is what you usually see out in public uh, for things like Twitter, you need to provide an API key with every request. Same with Google, same with like LinkedIn APIs, all that kind of stuff. So if you were trying to implement rate limiting, you need to choose which kind of identity um, protocol you want to use to identify your clients because generally speaking, you want to rate limit on the client level. Now, the next thing that you need to think about is you need to determine your application's traffic volume breaking point. Now, this is a little bit of an optional thing, and I'll tell you why. When we apply rate limiting in the context of keeping a certain SLA, uh, we need to identify what our breaking point is because we don't want to give our clients too much volume or too much flexibility in their rate limits such that it can exceed what our server is capable of handling. So say for instance, say we've, we've done a load test and we know that our application is capable of handling 100 transactions per second, 100 requests per second. We don't want to go off and give uh, throttling limits of you know 150 in total because if we do, that, that means that our application could potentially be overwhelmed since we established that our limit is 100. So you need to know what your upper bound is here and you do that by load testing your application. Then once you figure out that number, you basically need to, to say to yourself, anytime that you're giving out rate limits to your customers, you need to ensure that the sum of the rates that you're giving out does not exceed the breaking point of your application. I think that's pretty intuitive. Uh, and the third point is that you should probably use an already existing rate limiting library. Now, potentially you can build your own if you think that some of the ones that exist out there aren't suitable for your use case. This gets very, very tricky, especially in a distributed environment where you have multiple nodes that all need to communicate and collaborate. I just suggest using a pre-existing one. There's like a Google Guava library for Java, and I have an example here of what this looks like under Nginx. So just taking a look at this really quick, um, we're using IP address here. That's what binary remote address corresponds to, uh, specifying 10 minute intervals and one request per second. So this is what you would config an API as if you wanted to apply these limits under the Nginx protocol. Uh, okay, so that's it for the server perspective. Let's move on to what this means for clients now. So for clients, uh, it means that you need to use retry policies. You need to be capable of tolerating failure. Now, a good retry policy for a rate limited API will use something called exponential backoff. Now, what that means is that if you are faced with a request that is throttled, you shouldn't just retry right away. You should wait for a period of time. Now, how big that period of time is, is up to you. It's also dependent on how granular the rate limit settings are on the server level. But essentially, uh, if you fail the first time, maybe you want to sleep for one second. If you fail the second time, you sleep for two seconds. If you fail the third time, you sleep for four seconds. So you see the duration in which we are sleeping is growing by a factor of two with every retry limit as it goes up. Uh, the second thing is you also want to use a concept of jitter. So jitter just means add a little bit of randomness between your sleep duration. So if it's supposed to be two seconds, maybe make it like, you know, 1.77 seconds or something like that, or 2.18 sections, make that bit random there. And the reason that's important is if you have a lot of requests that are coming in all at once and they're getting throttled, you don't want them all to retry at the exact same moment. If you use just a hard coded two second sleep value, all the requests that came in at the same moment are all going to try again at the same moment. 
and they're just going to get throttled again so it doesn't make sense so it's better to use jitter here and a sense of randomness to ensure that you're kind of uh, not layering your requests all at once, but distributing them over time with a sense of randomness. And then if it wasn't already apparent, you need a sense of retry limit. So you don't want to be retrying over and over and over and over again into infinity. You want to cap this out. Uh, the most common retry limits that I've seen are three, and I've seen some in some cases go up to five retry limits. Uh, so those are generally good numbers to start with. And if you're not having success, you can always revisit them. And the second concept or the second thing that you need to be aware of if you are a client using a rate limited API is you need to be fault tolerant. You need to understand that certain applications that have rate limiting built into them are sometimes going to reject your requests. Um, so if you're trying to build a workflow that uses an external API that is rate limited and that workflow needs to be ACID um, or ACID compliant, you need to be fault tolerant and capable of rolling back some of the updates that you're trying to make in the case where your requests are being throttled or rate limited by a server's API. So if you enjoyed this video, check out the playlist on the right on system design concepts. I think it pairs really well with this video. And as always, if you liked it, please don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on my next video. Thanks so much, folks, and I'll see you next time.